My name is Ted Churchill, and this is Jerry Hallway. Together, we have 18 years operating the Steadicam system. We've worked on numerous feature films, commercials, industrials, and rocked videos. On the tape, we're going to demonstrate Cinema Products' new Steadicam EFP system. First, we're going to show you how it works, and then we're going to show you how to set it up and balance it. By the end of the tape, you'll have everything you need to operate the EFP. The handheld camera is a wonderful cinematic device. It's incredibly mobile. Anywhere you can walk, you can do a shot. It's exciting. It's also intimate. The problem is it has one inherent liability, and that is, is that it's unstable. The moment you take your first couple of steps, all that movement as an operator is now transmitted through the lens. The Steadicam EFP both allows the operator the incredible mobility of a handheld camera, but also provides the stability, the precision, and the elegance of a dolly. This is accomplished in four ways. First, the center of gravity of the camera is moved outside the camera where it's accessible to the operator. This is done by means of a counterbalance attached to the camera by a long center post. Secondly, a three-axis gimbal is employed that allows the operator to pan, to tilt, and also, on occasion, to roll. Thirdly, this whole camera unit, which is what we call the sled in the camera, is suspended in neutral gravity in space by means of an articulated spring support arm. As the operator walks or runs now, as the, that vertical movement is transmitted to the camera, it is dissipated by the time it gets to the end of the arm. Finally, instead of using the conventional viewfinder, because this would actually defeat the isolation of this unit from the operator, a video monitor is used to view the picture. Now, there's a couple of things I might mention to you. The first is, is that the skill of Steadicam is not easily learned. It takes some practice. It is totally unique. The more practice you get, the better off you're going to be, the better your shots are going to be. The other thing is, incorporated into this skill is understanding how to balance this unit. If the unit is balanced correctly, your shots will be amazingly precise. If it is not balanced, if you don't understand how to balance the unit, they're going to be marginal at best. A lot of the tape that we show you is going to be about balancing and trimming the unit correctly. But you'll enjoy it. Stay with it. You've seen how the Steadicam works when it's all put together, and now we want to show you some of the individual components. This is the docking bracket. This is the battery. And this is what we call the sled with a monitor attached. Here is the operator's vest or the operator's suit, not to be called a brace for obvious reasons, and what we call the articulated spring support arm. We're going to show you each of these components in detail, show you all the switches. But before we do that, let's just look at the docking stand and the docking stand mount, because it's important when you put this up that you put it in a place where it's going to be safe and it's not going to be knocked over. This is a standard C stand, and we've added a sandbag at the bottom to keep this thing from falling over and we tighten up the knuckles real good and tight, adding the docking mount. Several important parts, we've got a, a hook here to hang the arm on, we've got a balancing stud, this little 5-8 stud right here, and the camera, the sled will hang right inside here, and this is the aircraft pin that will keep it from falling out. It's going to be a little bit awkward from this side, but I want you to see it. Place it in. And in it goes, more or less. There we go. Get that out of the way. And you're ready to balance the camera. Now, when you do this, it's going to be necessary to put on all the components and accessories that you're going to be utilizing with the camera. If you have an onboard battery, that includes putting the battery in the battery holder and back for example. Now, now, a possibility is taking this battery off entirely. The EFP sled will run the camera and the monitor by itself, so that if you desire to have less weight, which is, which is obviously desirable, in most cases, you can pull this battery casing off and run it right off the four-pin cannon. But if you're going to put this battery on the camera, the onboard battery goes in here first before you balance. Now, for the sake of balancing, you certainly want to make sure that you have your cassette in. If you're working with film, that means you want to have the uh, film in the magazine. Uh, if you're doing film as well, 
you'll want to put on the video assist. This one's particularly weighty, so that will make a difference. If you're running any of the lens functions like focus, iris, or zoom by remote radio control, you'll want to put on your servo motor system. So once you have all your accessories on here, which let's assume that we do rather than do all these things, let's assume that this now has everything in it. Let's find the center of gravity of the camera. And Jerry, maybe you could help me with this one here. You want to take your, the post out of your arm. That's the most convenient thing we have. And place it underneath your tripod adapter. Now keep in mind, by the way, just to mention, is that you want to put this adapter plate on here. You can't mount this camera on the Steadicam without this plate. You must have a flat plate here, unfortunately. So we're going to put this on and we're going to roll this post until we find the center of gravity. Now, if we put it here, you'll find that the front of this drops. So let's move the camera back a little bit until neither front nor back drop down. That's yeah. basically the CG. Right, you just want to get it close, not, not too, uh, not terribly precise, just close. All and right. make a little mark for it. So now we have the fore and aft center of gravity of the camera. Now, what do we have to do next? We have to do the side to side. So I'll take this post and I'll rotate it 90 degrees to the right, run the post fore and aft, and now we have the ability to find the center of gravity side to side. It's, and it's, a, little, it's a little harder to find, but, but usually it's, it runs down the center of a video camera, or very near the center of a video camera. As you can see, we've already marked the center of gravity with this white tape. So now you know, fore and aft and side to side, where the center of gravity of the camera is. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to mount the, what we call the C-plate onto the bottom of the camera, and this will per permit us to marry the camera to the Steadicam. Okay, you want to mark the corresponding place on the bottom of this, this tripod adapter where the center of gravity was. And we've got the fore and aft down the center, and we've got this little piece of tape we're going to add just matches up with the one we've already found. And now we want to attach your clamp plate, your standard clamp plate, somewhere over this. And, and the proper place to do that is so that somewhere near the back center of the plate is approximately over the mark that you've made on the tripod adapter plate. And we'll find a place, that one of these holes, and look at the plate, the plate's full of little holes, and we'll try and find one that matches up with a hole that's already built into the, the uh, tripod base. And with the video camera, you want to get one of the, the most forward holes you can find that works, rather than one of the, re the rear holes. So, I think just a little further. Like so? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And pop it in there. Now, when you put this plate on, make certain that the plate is aligned fore and aft and squared up with the camera because you'll find, especially the better you get at operating Steadicam, if that plate is off a little bit and the camera is pointed off to left or right, that will adversely affect uh, your operating and the, and the feel of the whole unit. Now, since we only have one screw in here, it might be worthwhile to put double face tape between the clamp plate and the base of the camera so that as you're shooting during a day, if this gets hit or just from general use, it doesn't swing like this off like that. So align it. Now, one of the other reason you'll need to have this perfectly aligned is there's going to be a servo motor on the end of this rod. And this servo motor is going to mesh with a very fine tooth gear on the lens. And if this plate is off, it's not going to ride correctly on the gear. So that be quite accurate about this. Perhaps put the double face tape in and then torque the hell out of it. <laughs> OK. Neato. So now what we've done now is effectively provided the ability to marry the camera to the Steadicam mechanically. What we'd like to show you now is the sled and all its component parts. We'll start at the top and work down towards the bottom. At the very top is what we call the clamp plate, which comes off. There's a safety screw that prevents it from riding backwards. It's real important when you have the camera on there. The safety screw engages in this slot here, right along here, and that's what prevents it from going back. And on the other side of the clamp plate is this rack here. And that's, that's what we use to finally position the, the camera fore, fore and aft. This is a little gear that that rack engages in. If you see, I turn it right here. And that's what gives us our fore and aft control on balance and trim. Next to that is the, is the lock for the clamp plate. And just tighten that down. That clamps down on the dovetail. Okay. And on the back of this, 
right here, is a vernier so that we can get side to side adjustment, very fine control of side to side adjustment. You can see how that works. It's plates moving that way, and the upper stage is moving now to your left. On the front of this stage here is what we call the J box or the junction box. On the front of the J box are a number of connectors. There are three connectors for your focus, zoom, and iris motors a connector so that you can uh, attach to the zoom motor that's part of uh, video cameras, an on-off, film on-off connector, allows you to turn your film camera on-off without reaching up there and disturbing your balance, and an auxiliary 12-volt output connector so that you can run, uh, say, a video transmitter or something like that. On the inside of the opposite side of the J bracket are uh, a BNC in, so that if you your video camera, this is where the, the signal will go to feed the monitor. You've got 12 volts out if you want to power your video camera, which is generally the way you'll do this. Uh, or if you want to power your film camera, you can power it through this Canon connector here. You've got a bubble level to help you know where level is. And yet another connector that is the J7 connector that goes from here down to the J7 control on the gimbal. The wiring is conveniently located inside the post and connects directly to the bottom of the unit. This is what we call a center post. It's expandable. And the main feature here is this three-way gimbal that has three axes of rotation. There's one there, one here, and one here. And these three axes of rotation allow this, the support arm to have no influence on the sled. It can move up and down on the center post. Uh, loosen the clamp here. You can move it up and down here, which is critical for your operating and for balance. And we'll just leave it here for now. Right. right below that, down here, is a clamp that allows you to extend or shorten the center post. Shorten it up a bit here. On this electronics box is a battery indicator, a switch to turn on and off your remote focus system, an on and off switch for your monitor, and a, a, a circuit breaker. That's how to pop it. That's off. That's on on the circuit breaker for the whole system. On the other side, move the monitor out of the way. Right here is the connector that goes to the monitor. This is another auxiliary connector for, say, a video transmitter, and another auxiliary 12-volt output. There are three BNC connectors here, two video outs and a video in, and a termination switch. Somewhere along the line, you're going to want to terminate your video. You're either going to do it here or by adding an accessory that terminates the video. Down below this electronics box is a connector on the front side for your wireless control receiver. Turn around. This is your uh, connector for your brick battery, Anton Bauer brick battery. Just place that in there. There you go. All right, now let's take a look at the monitor. Okay, this piece right here is called your monitor support arm. It allows you to position the monitor high or low. The monitor will rotate around for low mode and for other things. Okay, you have a connector here. It's what we call the eyebrow, which flips right up. Okay, here are the parts of the monitor. We have a bubble level down here to help you keep level. We have a brightness control, looks like that. And we have frame line controls that allows you to set TV safe action area or Say if you had a uh, wide lens there. Okay. There's one more adjustment that we need to tell you about, and it's at the base of the center post. There are two screws here and two on the other side of the center post that allow you to move the base of the electronics here fore and aft for fine-tuning balance. When you add accessories uh, and other things, the balance of the, the sled changes, and you need to be able to fine-tune that. This is not so important now, but as you gain experience, it will become important to you. Okay, now that we've uh, shown you all the components on the sled, let's mount the camera. Now, the first thing we'll do is we have taken off the plate off the beta cam, and we are putting the plate on with the clamp plate that you saw before here. Before we mount the camera, this makes the, it a lot easier to put on the camera. It also makes it easier if you want to go to a handheld shot just to pull the camera off rather than pull the whole plate off. Now, you see I'm sliding the dovetail in here. It's catching in this rack gear right here. And you see the way it goes fore and aft like this? 
This is the way you balance fore and aft. Okay, that should be clear. Now, what I'm going to do now before I cut the camera on is I'm going to, one, lock this off so it will not rock back and forth. And critical in here is I'm going to tighten down what we call the safety slide back locking screw. This makes certain that if you tilt this up, this camera is not going to come off. Okay? So there we go. I'm going to lock it down again. And then I'm going to mount the camera. Very much like the M16. Okay, so now our camera is mounted. Check it. Make sure that this whole thing is solid. Now again, you can loosen this. You can move the camera backwards and forwards to balance. All right, so now what we're doing with the camera on here, we're going to balance this out. And we're going to balance it so that the rig is slightly bottom heavy. That means this weight here and the length of this post is going to be a little bit larger, the combination of those, of the length of this and the weight of the camera. You want this slightly bottom heavy. Now, how do you do this? There are two ways. One, you can move the gimbal assembly up and down. The other way is you can actually extend and retract the extension post down here. So there are two ways. Generally, when you balance, which we call bottom balance or bottom weight balance this, you'll do it by sliding the gimbal up and down this center post. When you put the camera on and you get ready to start to balance, you want your gimbal reasonably high so that your weight is going to be down below here. Or you want this post reasonably extended so that when you put this on the stud, we're about to show you this, the thing will not want to turn over. All right, now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this unit, and you see it has the battery in it, so it has everything on it that you're going to use, and I'm going to take it off the docking stand, and I'm going to spin the docking stand around, and I'm going to put it on the balancing stud that Jerry showed you before on the back. Now here I go. I pull the aircraft pin, and I hold this up. Fortunately, this is quite light. And I turn this around, and here now is your balancing stud right here. I take the gimbal yoke with the hole, and I put it in the stud like this. Now here again, you have to make sure that your stand is secure. You have a stand bag on it, because this is a lot of weight hanging off the end. Now, just from feeling this, I can feel that this is top heavy. And it's also front heavy. Now watch this. It wants to go to the front. So the first thing I might do is just move this camera back a little bit. OK, now we know fore and aft were reasonably, see that's free floating now. We know that fore and aft were reasonably balanced. Now we also know that side to side were reasonably balanced. But I also know that it's top heavy because I can feel it wanting to turn over. If I let this go now, this will want to turn over. There it goes, see? This is the gimbal handle assembly right across here. And it loosens by means of a small Allen screw right here. Now, we're going to loosen this up. Now, it's critical for you to remember that when you loosen this screw up here, that this is perfectly horizontal along here. Because what will happen is, if it is not, this will want to slide. This gimbal will want to slide. And it can go very fast. And if your finger's in there, you've got a big problem. So keep it always horizontal. Now, Jerry is holding the end of this. Do this with a friend. The first couple of times you do this, have them hold the steady cam on the bottom so that it remains level as you adjust the gimbal assembly up and down. Now, you see me doing that like this. OK, you can let go now, Jerry. So your friend lets go. And now you can see. Now, see, it's wanting to drop here. And what that means is it's a little top heavy. So I'm going to slide the gimbal up. Now, it's just about balanced correctly. Now, I'm going to slide it up a little more because I want it to be slightly bottom heavy. Now, why? I want it to be slightly bottom heavy because if I left it alone, it will always want to come back to face center, come down and seek, seek a level where it's straight ahead. So I'm going to add a little bit of bottom weight to it. Now you see it's starting to drift down to the bottom. Watch. Now I'm not going to let this go much because this gimbal will slide right up here. So before I do anything and demonstrate this, I'm going to lock this off again. Now, watch this now. This is very slight bottom weight here, OK? Now, you also may have noticed that when this goes down, it also goes to the side of it. See how it's going to the right? What that means is it's, it, it's telling you something else, which is it's a little bit right heavy. So I'm going to move the side to side camera mounting platform just a little bit to the left side. So this is telling you two things. It's telling you by how long it takes to come back to center 
It's telling you how much bottom weight you have, and it's also telling you whether or not you're balanced side to side with the camera. That's not bad, it's a little bit to the right. Now, it should take about three seconds for this to get back upright. Here we go, let's try it. 1001, 1002, 1003. So that's basically the kind of bo bottom weight you want. It's better to have less bottom weight than more because the more bottom weight you have, the more this device will want a pendular out when you come to a fast stop or you make a fast start. Uh, the less bottom weight you have, the more you can feel the rig and feel the unit, the more articulate you are with your hand and the better touch and better feeling. So try to keep the bottom weight very slight. It's uh, deceptive because if you put a lot of bottom weight in here, it feels extremely stable in the roll axis, so your horizon stays. But unfortunately, there are a lot of secondary characteristics this creates that everyone has found over the last 10 years to be highly undesirable. So keep the bottom weight slight so that uh, so you can get a good, nice, clean feel of what it's doing. OK, see this now here? Now, there's another way to add bottom weight or subtract it. And over here, I'm going to loosen up the locking collar that keeps the extendable post from going up and down. Now, I'm lengthening. Do you see this now? What I'm doing is I'm lengthening the post. All right, and I'm going to lock that off again. Now, you want to lengthen the post for a couple of reasons. It makes it a little bit slower, a little bit more stable, a little lef less hot roddy if you have a longer post. When it's very short, it's very quick and very fast, but it doesn't quite feel as stable. Now, what that's going to do is move this weight way out here from the gimbal, way far away. So you're going to find we have a lot more weight further away. We have the same amount of weight further away, and it's going to take less time to come back up to level. Watch, 1,001, 1,002. Too much bottom weight. So let's do this. Let's say we want the post this long. Let's lower the gimbal to get the gimbal closer to the weight on the bottom. And this will give us less bottom weight. So you see me moving this now. Now that's perfectly in the center of gravity. I'm going to move it up a little bit just so I have a little bit more bottom weight. A little bit more. Mango. Lock it off. Always lock it off. OK, so now this is locked. The post is locked. Let's watch it come back. And it will take about three seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and it did it. OK. So that's the deal on that. Now, let me just show you one other thing. This is the first time we've actually had this thing flying on a stand. But let me just show you these functions. Here is the camera pan, function one of the three-axis gimbal. Function two, not surprisingly, is tilt. And of course, with tilt, you have the ability, it's wonderful for architecture, to be able to shoot straight up. Okay, and axis number three, generally undesirable, is roll. Most of the time when you're operating, you're operating in pan and tilt, and you're controlling the roll. This is the EFP vest, which is designed to take the weight of the Steadicam and distribute it evenly over your body. Down here, we have the socket block, which is where the arm attaches to the vest. And there are a couple of screws here for personal adjustments on exactly the way you want that arm to lift. We'll get to that when we bring the arm along. This plate here can be reversed on the Steadicam, and that's for another way of operating. Uh, this is the first kind of operating we call left side operating. Flip it around, it's called right side operating. We'll show you that later on. The center spar here uh, attaches to the breastplate by a clamp arrangement. And we can collapse the size of the vest or extend the size of the vest depending upon your height or the length of the upper part of your body. Uh, I'm about 5'9", and I have it not quite fully extended, but about that long. And that's a good place to start. If you're shorter than me, squish it down to start. All right. There are straps which are adjustable. Uh, we'll talk about the shoulder strap first. That's not an adjustable one. It opens up this way on the left side. It's so an under the arm strap that goes here, and you adjust it by using this Velcro. And there's a uh, hip strap or waist strap with a quick release on it here. Okay. Uh, on the back of the vest is some Velcro that keeps it together, and you want to make sure this is nice and flat when you put it together for the first time. And this, when we pull the quick release handle, will separate and allow these pieces to fall right off. All right, I'll put that right back together now. 
At the bottom is a little pad that goes in the small of your back. And uh, that also has a quick release function on it. And uh, we'll, we'll show you how that works in a minute. The important thing is that this pad ends up in the small of your back, centered in your back. Right. To put it on, slide your right arm through the hole here. Don't, don't put it over your head. Slide the right arm through your hole, get these pads organized. And then lean forward. And this left shoulder pad will come up. Get it squared on your body and take the left under pad and hook it on here. Now this has been adjusted pretty well for me, but I want to push this down so that this feels centered. And I keep looking down to see if it's centered on my body. All right. And you don't want this whole thing to roll forward. If it rolls forward, that will distort the way this socket block supports the arm and uh, will give you trouble later. So this should be pretty tight. You want to be able to breathe, uh, but it shouldn't be able to roll forward. And you attach the pad in back. I'll turn around and show you this. The pad should be in the center of your back. So loosen it on the right side until it's, it's in the center. Pack it down. And then reach over here, loosen up this clip, put it, oop, put it together, and pull it tight. Now take this one, this one, and you're set to go. Now we're going to demonstrate the quick release feature. And Ted is going to help me by being the weight of the camera. Okay, keep in mind you have another 40 or 50 pounds uh, hanging off here. One thing we've got to mention, and it's extremely important, is that if you're going to be shooting in a dangerous situation, meaning you're shooting around the edge of a swimming pool by the water on a sailboat, uh, you're, you're being chased by uh, wild bison or whatever it is, and you think there's a chance you may have to get out of this thing and get away from something, you must check to make sure that the quick release feature works before you start working that day. This is critical. This is a safety thing, and we take it very seriously. Okay, so always check to make sure this works. We're going to do this right now for you. Here we go. I'm providing the weight of the camera. We're going to turn Jerry around so you'll see the way the vest opens up and back as he pulls the quick release. Ready? Okay. We've uh, just shown you two of the three basic components of the Steadicam EFP. Uh, the third one, and perhaps the most important one, is the articulated spring support arm. This arm uh, is a springed arm, which is designed very much like a human arm. As you see here, it has a, uh, what would be considered to be the elbow, and it swings thusly. Now, this arm has two functions. The first function of this arm is to support the EFP sled and the camera in space, very much like an object in space, floating in space. The second function of this arm is to take the vertical shock and movement of the operator's body, which you see very much in handheld photography, this bounce. And as it's translated through this arm and gets out to the end of this arm, it becomes dissipated by a series of springs in here. And this is the real genius of the Steadicam system, is this here, arm here. So that the arm attaches to the operator's vest, thusly, and tightens down with these two screws. There are some adjustments we'll get to in a little bit. The spring tension in the arm is adjusted by four Allen screws, one in the end of each of these bones, of which to comprise each section. You can tell the strength, the adjustment of the arm in the springs through this little window, this little cutout here. And there is a silver collar that moves up and down as you turn this screw to adjust the strength of the springs. In its maximum strength, this silver collar will be right up toward the top here. In its minimal strength, you'll see the silver collar is down toward here. You have the ability to put tape on here and mark the strength for various cameras because you'll be wanting to change the tension on these springs as you change cameras that have different weights. A Betacam 300 is vastly different than a first generation Betacam. So you will be constantly adjusting these. Now keep in mind that when you adjust these springs, you're two adjustments per section, and this is the section. You want to adjust these equally so that in this part of this particular section, if this silver collar is in the center, the silver collar on the opposite 
part of this section will also be in the center. It's not good to have these great variants in the, uh, in the tension of the springs here and here. All right, so now you have one section here you'll adjust and a second section in here. Again, four of these screws, the windows with which you can tell how much, how strong the arm is. Now, I want to point out one or two safety features of this arm, which you should be apprised of. The first one being that this has stops, you will notice in here, on each of these sections. Some of the older arms don't have these. But it is possible, you'll notice that when I push down, this is what the weight of the camera will do. Now, you see how much space there is in this arm. It is possible, if you had your fingers in here like this and let the weight off of this, you could crush your fingers. It makes this less possible with these stops, but it's still an issue. When you're operating, never get into the habit of putting your fingers in between what we call the bones here. Keep your fingers away from these. Now, when the arm is freely mounted on the vest without the Steadicam on it, another problem is a swinging arm like this. Now, if you let this arm alone, your assistant may be in back. You can very much get, it's very easy to knock someone's teeth out with this. So that generally when you're wearing this arm, you want to keep a hand on it all the time like this. And it's also very comfortable. So that you'll find yourself doing this. Don't let this swing freely. Also, if you're putting a coat on or something, you don't want to lift up your shoulder and have this come and hit you in the face as well. So there's a couple of safety features uh, you should be apprised of in this. Okay. So you take the male part of the socket block and insert it into the female part that's attached to the vest. Tighten these two screws because you'll see that this will rock back and forth. Now, that's an adjustment we'll talk about in a moment. But you want to tighten these down so that this is solid on your vest. And there's your arm. Now, here I'm going to take it off again. I loosen. The, actually, what you, when you get the adjustments for these, you can only loosen. You only need to loosen one because it does rock. You grab it here with your two fingers on top and bottom, and you pull it out. In, out. In, out. At the end of the support arm, you'll see there are two holes in alignment here with a tightening screw here. What these do is they accommodate a post called the arm post that goes in here and tightens down. And this is the post that the sled and camera ride on through the uh, gimbal yoke. Now, when you put this post in, make certain you tighten this screw down. You tighten this down. Not, you don't have to kill it, but you should just make it like nice and snug like so, because you don't want this post dropping out of here because your whole Steadicam is riding on it. Now, another thing about this post is you can raise the height of the camera by raising this post. So now I'll raise it up to here. I've added about five or six inches to the height of the camera, tighten it down again, and now the camera is riding up here. If you want the camera lower, you can use what we call a J bracket. This is primarily used for underslung or low mode operating. But if you want to get the camera about six or seven inches lower, it is possible to put this in. Now, when you put this in, it's been found to be advantageous to clock this about one o'clock that way. So you see it's not riding straight, but it's actually like this a little bit. I couldn't tell you why that is, but trust me, it seems to work great. Now, again, I'm going to tighten this down, but just sort of like finger tight. All right, now your camera is riding instead of up here, your camera is riding down here. You've added about or subtracted about 10 inches from it. What many operators have done in the past, because they find the long post a bit unwieldy, is cut down a post to the size of this post here. And this is Jerry's here. And they operate, in most instances, with a post this size. Now, you notice when I put this in, I'm not putting it in with just this much of lip coming out, because it's got to sink fully down into the hole in the gimbal yoke to support the, uh, the rig. So I leave about that much, an inch and a half in there, or like that. Again, I'm going to tighten it down, just sort of like finger tight. And there it is. Now, that completes the arm. This is the post now that the rig will ride in. And when you take it off the docking stand and put it back on, it's riding on this post. These adjustments of fore and aft and side to side, where the rig wants to go, are done through the arm and the vest with the socket block adjustments. And we're going to explain this to you now. Now, what we have done is we have taken now the socket block off of the vest. And here you see the plate here. And this will sit on the operator like this, as you saw before. And we have also taken the end of the spring support arm off as well. These two, as I pointed out before, marry to put the arm into the suit. And then you tighten these up. Now, you noticed before that I showed you the way this rocked back and forth. Now, you can probably imagine that's one of the adjustments.
fighting this. Always be fighting this. And it's a lot of wasted energy. Finally, we're ready to lift the rig with the Steadicam arm. And this is the only time that you're supposed to bend over, uh, bend at the waist. Uh, at no other time should you do that. You should always be standing upright, okay? So the deal is you approach the rig, get nice and square to it about this far away, bend over so that the post here can engage the gimbal. And make sure the post goes all the way in so it comes home. And then stand up straight, let the arm take the weight, Remove the aircraft pin, lift it out, and bring it to you. And let the arm take it. Don't be lifting it up here, but let the arm take the weight. And it will float over here beside you. You've already figured out how to balance using the weight, and now there's just a little bit of, it'll probably flop around on you a little bit. It may also want to float up like this because you haven't adjusted the springs in the arm, and now's the time to do it. If it floats up like this, relax these springs and it will tend to float down like that. If it's way, way down here, tighten the springs to bring it up to this, to this level. It should float about like this or, or maybe a little lower. Maybe these springs are a little too tight. All right. What you want to do is learn to walk around with this thing a little bit, get the sense of it. You notice we haven't turned the monitor on. You're not ready for pictures. Believe me, you don't want to see what's going on in the monitor. You want to get a feel for this. The important thing is your form to this machine. The right hand, in this case, grabs the yoke, doesn't cross the first set of bearings, all right? So it doesn't affect how this thing sits. The left hand lightly, right at the CG, under the gimbal, and just try and get a feel for it. Move it around, boom it up and down, and stay in balance. You notice I'm always in balance. I'm always standing up straight. And then when you get used to that for a while, put it back in the docking stand. Do that by putting it squarely in, taking the aircraft pin, the safety pin, and notice I'm standing up straight. I'm still in balance with this thing. Get that all the way in, and then bow away from it, just like you bowed into it. It's, again, it's the only time you do this, and you're out. Let's talk a little bit about the, the hand technique for operating. We're talking two hands here. The operating hand, which in this case is the left hand, is on the post, and the arm hand is on the end of the arm. Now keep in mind this hand, which is not your operating hand, is not inside the springs here. It is not on the gimbal yoke here, because this will in fact, fact will affect the way this operates. But it is here. There's a little cut in the yoke here. Make certain your hand does not go past that little cut. So this is a very comfortable place for this right hand to ride. When you have your J7 zoom control, you'll be able to zoom here. It fits right on this little knuckle here. So it's a natural place to have it. OK, what do these two hands do? The right hand is responsible for the vertical height of the camera. It also is responsible for the position of the camera. Is it far away from you? Is it close? Is it over on the right? Is it over on the left? It's basically the power hand, the position hand for the whole unit. The left hand is responsible for pointing the camera. This means that it's responsible for panning the camera. It's responsible for tilting the camera. And it's responsible for controlling what generally is an undesirable condition, which is roll. Those are the three axes. So now that's your left hand is your operating hand. And your right hand is your position hand. Now, you utilize these in conjunction. It's important when you first start to learn that you separate the functions of these hands. And you can practice that. You can practice this hand. You can practice this hand alone. What happens eventually is they both work together simultaneously. When you're doing a fast stop the way I'm doing or a fast start, you're not really doing it with this hand, even though it looks like it. You're doing it with this hand. You're doing it with your arm hand your control hand, your position hand. This is all done with this. All this left hand, operating hand, is doing is it's pointing the camera and feathering the position in terms of the way it points. All right, so that's the two-handed technique. 
It's important you do not apply force to this hand here. If you apply force, you're gonna find enormous instability in this. Use your force if necessary with your, with your non-operating hand and use the other one to do your very subtle moves. Now let's look at the grip here. Here's, you notice I'm using a fingertip control. I'm not grabbing it like this. This is hard style operating. If you grab it this hard, you'll find that you lose the feeling for it. You can't sort of tell what it's thinking. You can't experience what it's behaving. Hold it nice and gently. Now, these fingers here are not to be lifted off the post. In fact, you use those to control horizon roll, like this, so that these fingers on the side are doing that, and your thumb and forefinger are at the center of gravity. With this grip, you're able to completely control the unit. If you want to tilt up radically, you can take your little finger and put it behind the post and tilt up like this. Now, when you do a tilt like this, if you find it's difficult to hold, it means you have too much bottom weight. Take bottom weight off. This will gradually drift down. So now, we're talking very subtle. We're talking very gentle with this hand. The power hand will do all the fast stuff. This other hand will do all the, all the subtle stuff. It's a combination of these two hands. You've got to learn to separate the functions, then bring them back together and make them both work simultaneously. Okay, now we're going to show you the first exercise and what we call the Don Juan and the missionary positions, the basic operating positions. Uh, this is the missionary, camera facing forward, right here close to your body, somewhere in here. And the Don Juan is exactly the same, except the camera's the facing the other way. All right? The post is in the same relationship to your body. A common mistake in the Don Juan is to drag the camera way back behind you like this. You want to get it out here in front. It's, it's not hung up back here. All right? Now, if we're going to put these together into the first exercise, which we call walking the line, I want you to note that the camera always stays facing in one direction. All right? The camera's always going in this direction. And you start by putting the camera over a line on the floor, like we have, and just walk back and forth this way. Walk back, shoot forward. The missionary, walk forward, shoot forward the missionary. Now we're going to add something. Get used to this first, then do this. And we'll show you this several hundred times. Making the change. We go from the missionary into the Don Juan like this. Camera starts coming backwards. Walk back. Let it fly by you. I'm doing this very slowly. And now we're into that Don Juan position. Just what I showed you before. And you can go on to the end and stop and drag it forward, and we make the change coming back this way, this way. Move it forward, walk your hand around, like that. Now I'm going to show you the hand position as we do the change. And watch carefully as this hand walks around the post. Okay, here comes the change. I'm going very slowly. Hand slips around the post and just provides enough pressure here to counteract the friction in the gimbal. All right. And notice my hand is comfortable again. This arm is in a comfortable position. If I kept my hand in one position, immediately, well, it's impossible. You, you just can't do it. Or if I started here and I was comfortable, which is half the battle in operating this machine, if I kept my hand on the post, immediately, this would all get hung up in here. So the hand walks around. It stays in a comfortable relationship to the post. All right, my body faces the post. My hand walks around. All right. Now notice I stop myself and then stop the camera. And then I start the camera moving and then I start moving. And I watch I come to a stop and it gets out there a little bit. And I come back and I stop and I try and keep it in as close as possible. If I put it way out here, I can't see the monitor anymore. So I want to end up here, push it and I face this thing. And notice my body just stays pretty close to the line. There's a real tendency in doing these to get the thing going, get way over here, get over here. And that imparts a lot of 
side motion into this thing. Because your center of gravity is doing an awful lot of moving around, and it gets through. So if you can keep your, yourself close to the line as possible, it works out quite well. There's another tendency in this position as you're going across to lean forward. And that's a real common mistake. And I'll show that from the side. You're making the change. Leaning forward, that's bad. You want to lean back, you want to be in balance. If you let go, it would stay there at all times. You might try this even without the use of one hand or the other hand to see what exactly is happening. If you found during this whole exercise process that your buddy has decided to leave because they're not getting equal suit time or just have gotten bored with the whole process, it's possible to do this maneuver and exercise by yourself. And we'll show you how to do it. Instead of having a person in here as an actor, a friend as an actor, you put a cross on the wall. In the, on the monitor of the EFP, you put a similar cross. Now, if you're using a film camera like a 35SR or Aton LTR7, the ground glass has a cross right in the center of it. Uh, if you're using a video camera, put a cross on the monitor. Go through the exercise and attempt to register, that is, align the two crosses. And as you go back and forth making these switches, you'll see there's a lot of variance in this. Once you start to get good at aligning them up throughout the whole exercise, zoom in a little bit on the lens. Go a little tighter. It's more difficult. So that way, if you're by yourself, you can practice at home using this cross on the wall and a similar cross on the monitor of the EFP. If you find that you're getting tired, you have some alternatives. The first one, obviously, is to put it down. The other is taking the weight off that muscle. How do you do that? Here it is. The first way is to put this right over your shoulder like this. This totally relieves the lower back muscle, having this over. Another rest position is to put it on the opposite side. Now, this is the muscle that is getting worked, but the muscle that you've been operating with is not, which is the one on the right. So now I have it over here, I'm resting on the side, I get ready to go, I pull it over here again like that. So here's two rest positions. Another one is to hold it as close as you can to your body, like this, and you'll see this here. Now again, keep in mind what I say, the further away it is, the more fatiguing it's gonna be on your lower back. So here what I've done is I put it right next to my body and it's taking the weight off that muscle because it's as close to me as it possibly can. So here's three rest positions. Now that you've learned how to balance the rig, work with the weight, and you've started working with a two-handed technique, it's time to figure out what this unit is really good for. It's not just to run around with. It, it has some unique properties that we ought to explore. One really fascinating part of working with the EFP is its ability to boom rapidly, up and down, and quite precisely. You can pick any lens height quickly. We can also move laterally in space and quickly position the camera around. Okay, what might this be useful for? What can we use these, these wonderful features for? A simple pass-by is an excellent, excellent uh, shot to, to start with and to start exploiting these features of the EFP. Okay, Charlie, you wanna come walking along? We're gonna start boom down to hold headroom so we don't have to tilt up or down. Start boom down. And as Charlie comes towards us, we simply boom up to hold the headroom move around, and then we boom down again. And that avoids keystoning the set, and avoids having to, to tilt up or tilt down to hold headroom. Let's take another look at this. In addition to booming up and down to hold headroom, we can also move out of the way to keep the actor from getting too large in the frame. So, okay, Charlie, let's do it. So boom up, move out of the way, move back. Charlie comes along, boom up with him, move back, move forward, and boom down, hold the shot, and it's over. Very simple move, very easy to do. The shot that we're asked to do a lot is a walk and talk, and we can take advantage of our ability to boom and move laterally in space and accelerate uh, with the EFP in a walk and talk and make it a much more interesting shot than, than otherwise. Okay, let's start the shot. And we can start from behind. And in fact, this kind of shot, while amusing, is rather dull on the screen. But we can try and make it interesting. And here's a place I've just made a switch or a change. And I'm going in to an over the shoulder. 
And I picked up a single. Okay, now hold on for a second. I'll get this all over. Now I'm in the Don Juan. I'm shooting. I'm walking forward, shooting back, and I'm able to see where I'm going. Like avoid this, these floorboards here. All right now I can move up and get two of them in. That's how I'm booming up for Charlie, holding headroom, holding headroom. Stuff. So, now I can let them drift closer, or I can change my pace as they change their pace. Or I can let them go by again, and then I can come off to the side and walk with them. One of the really nice features of a steady cam is its ability to walk beside someone and adjust its speed fore and aft. Now I'm losing the shot here. But adjust the speed fore and aft with the actor. If I had to pan, the background rotates. But if I can simply accelerate to stay with them, have a much nicer shot. I can get quite close to objects. Or I can drift back. Or I can accelerate a little bit and give them a lead. All right. Or I can cross right in front of them and continue to walk and show the entire crew. OK, let's go back the other way. There are really marvelous bearings in the EFP, which allows it to pan extraordinarily smoothly. And that pan will just keep going and going and going until you decide to stop it. This allows you to make wonderful panorama shots. Okay, we can pan really slowly and then add a walk to it so that we pan around an object. So we start a pan like this, and then we hit the flowers, and we start moving. And now the flowers are staying in the center of the frame, and the pan is continuing in the gimbal. flowers are in the shot. And I'm getting dizzy. There it is. Look at my form. And unconsciously, I'm probably booming up while I'm on the downside of the hill. Hold the frame. And booming down or arming down as I walk up. With the EFP, you can make a choice about what object you'd like to pan with or pan on. Like now I'm rotating around this post, post briefly. Now I'm choosing to go around this corner and I'm holding the edge in frame to let the audience give the audience some reference. Here's another way to go around a corner. I'm just barely going to keep that in frame. I'm going to let the audience look to this next part. Now I'm going to rotate and go down this way. With the EFP, you have control over both the angle of the camera and the placement of the camera in space. And with that, you can impart to the frame a great deal more than you would by being forced into a simple pan. Now, we're going to take this corner one more time, and I'm going to add something else. Not only am I going to pan ahead around the corner, but I'm going to slow way down, creep, 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 because I don't need to stay at the same speed, and then suddenly go around the corner as if I were a person, making, turning it into a point of view as I rolled. We've been working hard to get the power to, to place the camera exactly where we want it. And it is also possible to follow someone quite precisely. But let's take a look at what happens when we do that. We're going to hold a frame. And now, go ahead, Charlie. And wherever he goes, we're going to hold almost the same frame. We're keeping him head and shoulders. And by doing this, we have an enormously boring shot. 
and I worked very hard to go through that space just then. But I have no idea where he is or what he's doing. Okay, now we're going to show you the same shot, only this time I'm going to vary my pace in relationship to Charlie's pace. I'm going to get closer to him, further away from him, to give the shot some interest and also make the story clearer. Okay, Charlie? If Charlie's an archaeologist, we want to see what he's looking at. I can still get close to him. Using my boom arm. And that would be a good place for a cut. One thing you don't want to get stuck doing is making endless, endless shots that make no sense. Cuts are useful. For instance, now I think it might be nice to have a cut. Let's try the same shot again, but this time we're going to add an actress at a strategic point. Okay, and let me get set, and go ahead, Charlie. I'm trying to time my going through the door here with Charlie. exploring this space. I don't want to get too close to him. I've seen his face once. I know who he is. Bang. Found my actress. Now I go for her. And I want to roll right around. Whip pan to Charlie. I want to get ahead of him. One of the things you've got to get into the habit of is trimming to the headroom of a shot or the action before you start the shot. We'll try it with Jerry here as an actor. Here you are, and we'll start this camera so we'll see the picture. I'm doing a walk along with Jerry in front of him, for example. I don't want the camera trimmed up here like this because I'm going to have to fight it each time by tilting down, nor do I want it to be here and have to fight it to come up this way. What I'm going to do is check his headroom and trim the camera fore and aft to his headroom. So that now this camera will remain at that headroom. Even if I'm doing a switch, I can be reasonably certain that headroom will be maintained if I lose sight of the monitor. OK. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about a little bit is utilizing the arm in order to maintain the same level of the camera. Now, this is particularly important if, for example, you're going up a curb or down a curb, where you want that move to be transparent. You don't want people to actually sense or see the fact that you've made that rise or dip in the camera. So what we've done is we put two apple boxes here. And this is something you can practice at home, uh, is doing this too. And this is all you're doing now is you're attempting to keep this lens on the same level as this line that we've put here, right here. So you're going to walk along this line, and you're going to attempt to keep the camera level with the line as you go up and down these boxes. As you're doing that, what you'll find is when you take your step, you're going along, when you take your step up, you're going to arm down. You see how the camera maintains that level. If I didn't do that, the whole camera would raise up like this. So what we do is we go along here, and I'll do it slowly. As we step up, we arm down. As we step down, we arm up. As we step up, we arm down. As we step off, we arm up. This will maintain the level of the camera. If you've had a lot of fun with the last exercise, we're adding a few tricks here to improve your operator skills. Uh, this one's called the rising line with the boxes. And it's the same thing before, but you've got this rising line. And it's really difficult. Not bad. And you can also do this in the Don Juan. helps you separate the boom function real well. Rise, rise, rise. Boom down, boom up, 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 down, up, up, up. Make the change. Keep going. Ah, missed it. But you get the idea. 
Throughout this tape, Jerry and I are constantly mentioning safety. Now, safety is an issue with Steadicam. It is not the same as operating, for instance, a ped camera on the floor of a studio. Steadicam is essentially an athletic event. And as such, there are certain precautions you must take. One of the things we all do is we always wear knee pads. These particular knee pads are plastic. They're made for skateboarding. They are give you the most protection of any knee pads there are. Before I ever pick up the Steadicam, I put on my knee pads, and I do this habitually, because one never knows when one somehow or other inadvertently might take a fall. The difficulty with falling with the Steadicam is you may have anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds attached to you. If you're wearing knee pads and you take a fall, the chances are you can feather the equipment and lay it down on the ground, protecting your knees with the pads. Without them, you have a tendency to bury the equipment in the ground to protect your knees. So it's worthwhile. I got these on. Think about your footwear. If you're in a situation like this, you might even want to wear cleats, especially if you're doing a running shot. The third thing to remember when you're out on location is you must always check the terrain over which you're going to be shooting. In a case like this, you might be looking for roots, branches that will come up, things that you'll hit, anything that will not only disturb the shot, but actually could drop you during the shot, which of course you don't want. Now, this is also true in inter interior locations as well. Someone leaves an apple box right in the middle of the frame. You don't see it. You come around a corner through a tight door. There's a slippery floor. Somebody spilled Coca-Cola on it. No one really cares because no one else is wearing the Steadicam, but you have it on. You come around the corner and you slip. So it's very important you take care of yourself because other people generally are not going to do it. They don't know what you require. They don't know what's safe and unsafe for you, and you have to deal with that yourself. Check the terrain over which you'll be shooting. Check it before you do each take or after you do each take. Spotting for the Steadicam is an art. And I've got a really good spotter here, John. I use him all the time. And he keeps me out of trouble. We're going to do a very complicated shot. And we'll see what happens. OK, Charlie, not there. Let's go. I am doing some navigating myself. Okay, watch. Okay, I am looking for things. If I keep looking away, looking forward, it's great in the down one, so that I can see where I'm going and place the camera near objects such as that post. Or back Step the down. other way. I'm going backwards. I really need spotting here. All right. I'm coming up. Steps right behind you. Ah! Okay, I'm stuck. Got into a point where I couldn't even be spotted. Okay. You know what's neat? There should be a camera seeing what we're seeing because you guys were going like this. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. There are essentially three kinds of shots that you might be requested to do on an exterior location like this. The first might be a preceding shot in front of the actor, the second a following shot behind the actor, and perhaps the third the actor's point of view, or you might be asked to do all three. Now I'm looking at the terrain here, and I see that this could be a problem, there's a branch here, but over here I see we have a real problem. And this is, look at the size of this hole here. Now look at the scenario, if I hadn't scouted this. I'm running along here, let's say as a POV, I hit this, probably break my ankle, come down here, nail my shin, shatter my kneecap. This is a reason to check this out first. Now what am I going to do? I'll have either somebody in props fill this in, or if that person isn't available, I'll make sure I know where that is. So when I come galloping across here, I avoid that and jump this. Now this I can see, of course, this, so it's not a problem. Even doing the Don Juan, as I'm coming along here like this, take my eye off the monitor, make the step across here like that. All right, let's see what else we have. These are high. These are not going to be a problem for me. I can brush by this. This terrain all looks fine. Here, if I have to come in here, I may want to break these branches back just to give myself some clearance. Here's another one here. All right, so constantly what you're always doing here is you're just checking. It's very much like a racer checking the race course in the morning before the race happens. Make sure there are no oil slicks, curves that are too tight. You're doing that. You're protecting yourself. It's important. This job is not a typical camera job. It's extremely exciting. It also can be occasionally dangerous. So take care of yourself because basically you're the one that knows about it. Other people don't know your problems. You have to know just to protect yourself.
Let's talk a little bit about running. Now, I don't suggest that you start to run with this until you've had some practice with it. So wait a couple of days before you even think about this. Have somebody with you. Don't run in the woods. Try in a parking lot, someplace that has level ground, someplace where there are not a lot of bogeys you can trip over. All right, now here's the thing about running. is If you're running at any reasonable speed, you're not going to be able to utilize the two-handed technique. The reason being is this arm is going to be needed for counterbalance so that you're going to be essentially operating with one hand. Now, obviously, this affects the stability a bit. Another thing about running is you want to conserve some amount of energy because if you use up all your energy in running and this rig starts to get away from you, in other words, it starts to get out from you, you're not going to be able to catch up to it in order to stop because stopping with a steady cam requires that you get underneath it so that if you're running along and it's out here, you've got to have the energy to get up underneath it to stop and pull it back and not being able to catch up to it because you don't have the energy is a big problem. So always keep 10 to 20% of your energy in reserve when you're running. Those are some of the issues. Check the terrain, as I said before. It might help to adjust the unit back a little bit so it comes back toward you because naturally when you're running, you tend to be leaning forward. You don't want to let this get away from you like this. So adjust it so it comes back toward you to balance that out. All right, now I'm going to try a running shot, and I'll show you through this. Again, do not try it in the woods. When you do this, try it slowly at first. Try it at quarter speed until you get the feel. Then gear up and do it a little bit faster so you know. Do it with somebody with you that can help you with this. Okay, let's try a running shot. I'm going to start with two hands. Go to run. Jump the log. Watch the monitor. Watch the terrain. Make sure it's level, critical. All the time coming up here, and I'm going to come to a stop. Get underneath it, feather to a stop slowly. I'm going to do a preceding run now. I'm going to do a switch. I'm going to start with two hands. Take one off. Watch the monitor. Watch the terrain. Watch the level. Watch them all. Here I go. We've just freed ourselves from the tyranny of the tripod and the dolly, and we shouldn't get locked into a particular mode of operating, such as working always in wide angle. It's really nice to take a lot of shots in telephoto. People are prettier in portraits, for instance, or you get really nice movements, such as we're going to do now. Charlie and Andrea, take this. Just keep pace with them. You must be trimmed in this kind of shot. If you haven't adjusted your trim for headroom, in a lot of trouble. It's really nice when you have objects pass between you and the steady cam and you just keep the your pace consistent and they appear at the same place in the frame. Thanks for really nice pictures. And there they go. They're white forever. When working on stairs, especially stairs that don't have a constant rise, you'll find that you and the actors are out of sync. You're going along flat when they're rising. And it's real important that the camera stays in sync with the actors. So you can use your boom function to stay with the actors while you go along. You can also use the boom function so that it gives you a chance to look forward and find the stairs while you're in the Don Juan. Okay, so let's, let's try one. Let's go. Okay. So we're going along, they're rising up, I'm rising up with them. I boom down, because I'm not going anywhere. They're coming up, I boom up with them. I got a boom down for me. Boom down, they're coming up. We're going up together now. Boom down. I come up with them. Down. It's very hard to do this and talk at the same time. Let's do the stairs another time. This time going down the stairs. And uh, pay particular attention to the booming action. Notice how the camera stays in sync with the actors. Now let me get set. And there's our shot. Let's go. Go ahead. They go down, I go down. I come up. They go down. Okay.
EFP, it is possible to operate uh, either on the right or the left-hand side. That means that the sled and the camera will be either on your left or on your right. Now, this socket block down here is set up for left-hand operating, meaning that you're actually grabbing the center post with your left hand. It's possible to operate now on this side with the sled and the camera on this side if you decide that uh, your right hand feels more comfortable. Now, in order to do that, you must change the side that the arm is on, and that is done in the following way. In the vest, with the socket block plate, you loosen up four screws that hold it onto the center spar. Now, keep in mind, these are easily lost. There are two washers on each of these screws. Uh, you can see that now the socket block and the socket block plate are coming off to the left-hand side. Now, what that means is when you insert the arm, the arm will come cross-chested around to the right, and you'll now be holding the Steadicam sled, and the camera will be on your right-hand side. You'll be operating with your right hand. So this has been switched from this side to this side. Now, there's one other operation that you must do with this in order to change sides with the arm, which is what we're doing. Now, on the Steadicam arm, the other part of the socket block here, if I were to put this in now, the arm would actually be facing now upside down like this, which doesn't even really qualify as low mode. So what we want to do is, in this part of the socket block, and I'm going to lay this down on the table so you can see it, you take this aircraft pin here, push down on the button, and pull it out. There's your aircraft pin. All right, this comes apart, and you flip it over. This is basically just an A and B deal here. And put it back in, hold that in place, and put your aircraft pin back in, like that. Now what you've done is you've flipped over the male part of the socket block as well. And you'll see now that when I put this in, it will, in fact, be right side up. Voila. I tighten these down again, remember, as I told you. And now the arm comes across chested. The Steadicam sled is on the right-hand side, and you're operating with your right hand. OK, so far in this tape, you've seen us operating on the left side. Now I'm demonstrating operating on the right side. The only thing that's changed here is that the right hand, the right hand, this one, <laughs> the right hand is on the gimbal, is doing the pointing and the aiming, all right? It has the same light touch. And this is going to feel strange if you've been practicing the other way, all right? And the left hand is now doing the booming, and I'll get back here. Left hand's doing the booming and the placing in space. But the missionary position is still the missionary position. Don Juan is still a Don Juan. And you may do this either simply because you prefer it, or in circum certain circumstances, like passing close by an object, it's a little easier to do it this way than it might be some other way. All right. Now, the next thing I want to point out, and we've shown you this before, and I want to make the point now again, is that the boom range of this is limited. It goes up this high and goes down that low. This, this is as low as it gets. One way to get lower in the high mode is to use the J bracket, replace the main post here with the J bracket, clamp it in, and then the gimbal, the yoke, will sit down about eight inches lower. And consequently, the rig will sit about eight inches lower. If you need to get your lens height even lower than you can by using the J bracket, you're going to have to invert the sled. You're going to have to put the camera on the bottom and the electronics on the top. To do that, you're going to have to put a clamp plate on the top, onto the handle. You might bolt it on there. Or you might use an accessory, such as the low mode or underslung cage. Right. In this way, we, we, put, we bolt the camera to the bottom of this. And on the top, we're going to bolt on the clamp plate. And we'll show you, we'll use this in a minute. Another accessory that you need, for reasons that will become obvious in a little bit, is the J bracket. But before I get to that, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. The center of gravity of the camera is right here. And we found that earlier on in the tape. When we put the new clamp plate on, it needs to be directly above where the old one is. That's our guide. If this one is correctly mounted, the one on top will be correctly mounted. OK, next time you see this, it'll be in the cage. One thing you've got to do to the sled is invert the monitor. To do that, just raise the monitor up. Loosen the bolt back here. Flip it over. That. Tighten it up. 
Looks a little strange from this perspective, but the whole rig, remember, will be operating upside down, and this is the way you'll be able to view the monitor. We've now got the camera in the low mode cage with a clamp plate on top, right above where it used to be on the bottom. I'm gonna turn the camera upside down and insert this back into the rig. All right. Okay, there it goes in. Remember to tighten the safety screw. We haven't done that in a long time. Tighten your clamp plate down. Now you're ready to flip the rig over. Sometimes it's useful to have a friend help you out with this. Lift it up. All right, now you're gonna to wanna to attach your cables and then balance the rig as we do in the normal fashion. Find neutral balance just like we did before. There's neutral, now we wanna raise it up our half inch. Check it again. Still a little bit too bottom heavy. A little bit. Helps to make faces when you do this kind of thing. All right, now it's quite off side to side and fore and aft. It's just not gonna, you know, turn around here. It's, it's not gonna hang very pretty. So change that. One thing, that, one trick that you can use is if, if something's hanging down, if you wanna make it neutral, you can always say, move the weight uphill. So we're gonna try moving the weight here uphill. Although this rig is perfectly balanced, we've created a problem for ourselves in that there's no room for our operating hand below the gimbal. And remember, even though we're in low mode, we still have to put our hands below the gimbal at the CG. We used to have our hand up here, now it's down here. How do we change this? How do we get more room? How, how can we raise the gimbal and still have this thing operate properly, have the right bottom heaviness? The way to do that is to fully extend the post, to drag this mass way up, which drags the center of gravity up a little bit, but gives us just enough room to put our hands in there. So, here we go. I find it quite hard to get this post all the way out, really out. There it goes. There we are. Got quite a lot of room there. This thing can go out about 15 inches from fully collapsed. All right, now we put this, the gimbal at the center of gravity. Find out where our balance is. Right there. And then we raise it about a quarter of an inch, just as we did in our basic balancing technique in high mode. All right. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, a little light. Get a little bit more room in there. Get too far. Okay. That should do it. And then we'd retrim so it'd be perfectly level again. You see it's hanging a little bit off. And then we're ready to add the J bracket. Put this away. There's one more accessory we need to make this low mode or underslung mode work, and that's the J bracket right here. And you may wonder why on earth we need this silly little piece of metal. The reason is that if we simply stuck the arm into the yoke, into the gimbal here, the arm would hit the camera and we wouldn't be able to pan, or we probably wouldn't be able to tilt very far or anything else, and that would be pretty self-defeating. Let me hang this up. So here's what we do. Place the J bracket, the short piece, in here. Okay, now we're gonna put the safety pin, the screw, through here. You could use a screw or a pin or a nail or anything, practically. Get that all the way through, and then tighten down real hard on this clamp. Remember, we told you not to do that in high mode. It's absolutely essential in low mode to have both the clamp and the pin in place. Otherwise, the whole rig could fall on the floor and that would be a disaster. Next, we're gonna take the arm and remove the mounting post. Okay. And now, when we dock, this long part of the J bracket, this is the position it will be in, will slide in 
and just stay there and be free. We won't use this clamp anymore. We'll just slide in and that will be how we'll, we'll dock and operate in the low mode. Notice that I'm seeing what it feels like first. And again, I'm operating on the right side and in low mode. This hand grabs the J bracket under here. That's a good, comfortable place to grab. And my right hand, the operating hand in this case, is underneath the gimbal and trying to find ways to walk it around. I'm testing all this out as I go. I run into the cables a little bit, so I want to just be aware of that. All right. Now, one thing I want to show you is the boom height. This is about as high as you can go. All right, the lens is about there. Now, there's two sort of all the way downs on this. One, it's about that height, and that's as far as my operating hand can reach. That's fully extended. Okay. But if you notice, the arm isn't at the bottom of its boom range. If I push the arm all the way down, I've got to really reach and distort my body to get all the way down, and that becomes awfully uncomfortable. When the director asks for a shot that's this low, you've got to be real careful that you don't do it all day. It's very tiring. That's why low mode is more tiring than regular operating. It's because your hand is so much lower and your body gets into odd positions to make that happen. A couple more things that make low mode operating a lot more tiring. One is the width of the camera or the cage forces you to operate further away from your body, which is naturally more tiring. All right? The other is that our normal rest position is not available to us anymore. But the only thing you can do is kind of crank it over like that. You're probably wondering why we go to all this trouble to put the camera in low mode. Take a look at the kind of shot you can get. One of the more exciting things about Steadicam is occasionally you encounter shots where you actually don't have to wear it. This is, in a sense, the desk job of Steadicam. And what it is, is mounting the Steadicam on some sort of vehicle. Now, there are different parameters for this, and there are also similarities to wearing it uh, yourself. All right, the first thing that we've got to consider is your safety. Generally, vehicle shots are done whenever you have action that moves too fast for you to keep up with if you're running on foot. Now here we have a pickup truck and we have mounted on here a vehicle mount on top of a Mitchell base hi-hat and to that you attach the arm. Now you'll notice here that this is very similar to the uh, socket block arrangement on the vest, only instead of now of being on the vest, it is hard mounted to the vehicle. Attached to that again is your arm. <laughs> now just like when you're wearing it, you'll want to balance the steady cam just like it's on your body. That means you want to balance it so that when you're on the terrain on which you're going to shoot the shot, that it's not going to go left or right or come back or go away from the vehicle. So that we're going to do this whole balancing routine just like you would on your body. You want to balance the EFP the same way you would balance it on your body. Now here is your mechanism right here and just assume that this is the same deal as if it was on your, on your waist. Now one thing I want to point out to you is these are rather delicate. When you adjust these, for example, if I want this to go to the right, I'm going to extend this aircraft screw right here. Now, if I were to have the EFP on this side of that, I would be fighting the weight of it. So I put it over on the right hand side and then I adjust this out because the weight wants to take it out that way. Now another thing to remember about balancing this is you want to make certain that as it sits here that it's the, the vehicle you're on is on level ground and it's on the ground that you're going to be doing the shot. For instance, we're at an angle here, but if I'm out on the road, this is not balanced. So get out on the road if that's where the shot is going to happen and balance it out on the road. The key issue in vehicle shots, of course, is safety. 
there are tremendous inertial and centrifugal forces at work when you ride on a vehicle, especially going at high speed. Fast stops, fast starts, heavy duty bumps, and very fast turns. You've got to take care of your own safety and if possible, the safety of the equipment as well. Now, you're hard mounted to the vehicle with the Steadicam, so make certain the mount, and we have one here, is solid on the vehicle. We have this done with one ratchet strap and two sandbags. It is not gonna be enough. You must always remember you have 40 to 50 pounds of equipment hanging off one side of this mount. That means that in the back on this side, just like your right lower back muscle, if you're operating left, now that's where the strain is. This is where it must be pinned down. Be very, very cautious about this. Now, in addition, if you happen to go around a fast turn, a fast stop or start, you don't want to be thrown off the vehicle either. So what we have here is a piece of sash cord that is around me. You notice it is not around my neck, it is underneath my right arm and it goes over my left shoulder. Now with this, this means that if the vehicle were to accelerate rapidly, suddenly, that you wouldn't be thrown off the back. If this were adjusted, obviously you'd put this on and you'd have somebody adjust it for the most comfortable position, which would be roughly around here. So now the vehicle starts fast and this restrains you and holds you back. Now keep in mind you're going to have to deal with it also laterally, side to side. You go around a fast turn, you may be flown this way. Now in this EFP tape, we're not going to explain all the techniques for riding on a vehicle. It's just simply not possible. But what we do want to do is reiterate, it is absolutely imperative that you take care of yourself during this process. That means first, you never ride with the rig at full speed before you test out the terrain on the vehicle. Try it at quarter speed, try it at half speed. Put the rig on, try it at half speed to make certain there are no bogeys here, that nothing happens. This is absolutely critical for your safety. Just like when you're wearing it, you probably are going to want to operate cross-chested. What that means is now the arm, very much like that being in the suit, is here. Make certain the arm doesn't hit your knees, and now you're able to operate here. Now another position, which I use a lot, although it certainly requires a sound blanket, is to put the mount between your legs. Now, one of the nice things about this, assuming you have some padding here, of course, is that this tends to make sure you don't get thrown off the vehicle. And again, I have my strap back here around me and now tightened up and adjusted like this. I'm basically secure here. Now I have all the room in the world in order to operate this. I can pan to the left, I can pan around to the right, I can even bring the arm around and I can even go to here. All right, so one of the other things about where you put the rig is how much versatility do you have? You'll notice that the sled is comfortably away from this vehicle. No matter what happens, I'm not going to smash this equipment on the vehicle. option should you choose to accept it, and I frankly don't myself very often, is rather than hard mounting the rig to the vehicle, is to actually wear it on the vehicle. Now the only reason you'd want to do this is if you had a shot where you were tracking on the vehicle and then you wanted to get off and walk somewhere else, or you wanted to walk and then get on the vehicle and have it go. It is more dangerous. If you're going to do this, the thing to consider is taking the vest and compressing it up all the way. The reason being is that this will cut into your legs and cut the circulation off in your legs, just the end of the vest right in here on the bottom. So compress the vest, make certain that you're tethered in. Now the problem with this is you have all this weight that's hanging out and that if you don't have a tether that's tight on your chest, you're going to be supporting all this weight with your lower back and you have about two minutes max on this. So that with a tight tether, watch this, this holds my back, it actually is supporting my back and then I can operate this like so. You should have somebody with you when you're not hard mounted to the vehicle that can hold on to you, keep you from going this way or that. It's much more important to be stable on the vehicle when it's not hard mounted. Hard mounted on the vehicle, you can totally concentrate on operating. Here, you have to be more concerned about where your body is going to go. It's obvious. Using the FP, it is possible to make a static subject appear to be moving. 
There isn't much wind today, but if there were, if the wind doubled in speed, then the force on the rig and the effect on the rig would be cubed. So quite quickly, at about 10 miles an hour of wind, it's a serious problem for the stability of your shots. The way to solve the problem with the wind is to keep a flag upwind of you and keep the wind off the rig. And you use a little telltale like this little red one we have here, a little piece of yarn, so that the grip knows to aim that telltale at the rig. Right? And that allows us to shoot in about 270 degrees rotation. But if we had to shoot into the wind, obviously this won't work. The solution is to put the 4x directly downwind. Now the wind has shifted around on us, so we're in the same position we were before. But if the wind were flowing in this direction, the 4x would prevent the wind from flowing by the rig. And if you could get two 4x's and put them in a V behind here, you'd be operating in an even better protected pocket that the wind wouldn't hit the rig. And now we'll just go ahead and do a little shot here. You can go along. and keep everything nice and steady. From all our discussion of trim and balance, uh, you should be pretty aware that anytime you add or subtract something from the rig, that that will affect the balance and you must rebalance in side to side, fore and aft, and top to bo bottom with the gimbal. You must always be checking your balance. Now, if you add a cable to the rig because you either have to run video out or audio in or something like that, a cable is a serious and shifting force on the rig. As, the, as the, the cable gets longer, there's more of a force and will tend to pull it to the side. So you must be real careful working with cables. A key, or one way to help you, is to get the smallest, thinnest, most flexible cable you can. And this is a little tiny video cable. Use about 10 or 12 feet of that. Make a loop and take the twist out, because the twist will also affect the way the rig hangs. And loop it up under the back here. And make sure that the, the cable isn't so long that it catches underneath your knee and sends you down to the floor. But it should be long enough, and you need to test this, so that it doesn't affect the rig. You can go in the Don Juan, either boomed all the way up or all the way down or all the way over on this side, and the cable isn't catching or affecting the rig. It's the basic way to do it. Again, you tack it so it's going straight down, right in front of the gimbal, close to center gravity and has a cons more or less constant pull to one side and, and you trim side to side to correct for that to a degree but then you have to really watch your bubble to get good shots if you use an audio cable which is infinitely heavier and thicker uh, maybe you could make up one that was smaller but but generally they're thicker uh, you have to just pay a lot more attention to what you're doing because it's a lot larger mass and it shifts more uh, the force shifts more on the rig We've spent a lot of time trimming the rig and making sure that it hangs level, but in the middle of a shot, you may have some difficulty figuring out if your shot is actually level. You can look at verticals in the shot as you go by them, but they aren't always there, or they aren't always there at the right time. We've provided below the monitor a small level, a physical level, so that you can see if the bubble's in the middle, whether you've got a level shot. Our only concern is that that level may or may not reflect the level that, that's oriented to the frame. The frame may be one way, and this monitor may be tilted another way. So you must conform the level on the monitor with frame level, with camera level. And we do that at the beginning of every day. And the, the way we do that is we take a little tiny level, like we have here, line level, and we place it somewhere on the camera that we know is level with the frame. And then we physically move the camera tilt it one way or the other until we have true level in the camera, in the frame, and then we physically move the monitor. And I'm going to turn it around so you can see this. Here we are. We physically turn the monitor until the bubble level here, the slave level, if you will, conforms to the master level or camera level. All right. One concern that you have is that this little physical level is curved and only works if these two little lines are facing straight up. All right? if, it, if the lines are facing down, the curve is the wrong way, and it simply won't work at all. So you must make sure these two little black lines are uh, facing straight up. 
Another concern we have, and I, I guess I can show it with this, is that any time the camera is accelerating left or right, going around a corner, the bubble is of no value. The bubble just moves around. So you can only look at the bubble or use the bubble level when you're going straight ahead or straight back. You can get a hold of a JR to practice your Steadicam moves. And you can do all your Don Wanning and booming and panning around objects, learning about the isolation. It's also great for blocking shots. If you don't want to lug the rig around, but you want to show the director what a possibility might do, you can do it with a JR, get it on tape, and play it back without all the drama of putting on the rig. Let's talk for a moment about what we in the trade call the three F's, and that is form, feedback, and framing. These are all extremely important. Now, form we've talked about a lot in this tape, and essentially it has to do with keeping the rig close to your body, not hitting it with your leg or with your shoulder, because the closer you have it to your body, the more comfortable it's going to be. The further away, the more it's going to get you in the lower back. Stand up straight. The tendency with some operators when they first start is to hunch down and do the old Rambo sumo, like this. Now, this is extremely uncomfortable. You may think it looks good. It does not look good. Pretend you're a matador, and you're standing more like this. Whether you're in the Don Juan or the missionary position, you're standing up straight. And this, of course, is the same with the switches. In order to get the camera away from yourself, you don't bend over like this. You take and you push it away with your arms, and that gives you the latitude to pull it around to the other side. And then it comes back close to me again. So watch your form. Now the second F is feedback. How do you know if you're doing this correctly? One way is to do it in the mirror. Watch yourself. Make sure it's close. Go through all the routines. Another one is to have a friend videotape you and watch it back later. It's enormously helpful to see yourself do this. That's the second. The third, perhaps the most important, is framing. Steadicam operating, Steadicam shots are generally much more difficult than shots done with conventional cameras. They're also far more interesting, far more fun. The difficulty is that in learning Steadicam, you have a tendency to forget about aesthetics while you're learning all these forms. So at a certain point, when you have these down, you can shoot in missionary position. You can shoot in Don Juan, and you can make switches that are virtually transparent. You've got to start thinking about aesthetics. Your work is going to be gauged as if you were on a conventional camera. They're not going to be forgiving of Horizon that does this, nor headroom that's too high or varies a lot. So try to keep the headroom consistent, keep it nice and tight, make sure your horizon is always level. Practice these things. Think about the shots you're doing. Design your own shots. Figure out what a great application would be so that now what you're doing is you're not only just operating, you're thinking all the time about how the shot will work, how it will go, where you speed up, where you slow down, how you come around a corner, how you go through a doorway, what height the camera is at, how far you are away from the actor. All these things are what makes Steadicam an enormous amount of fun, and it's all the things that other cameras can't do. Well, that's it. This is the end of the tape. We hope you've enjoyed it. If this is your first time viewing the tape, go back and review each section one at a time. Remember, take your time, practice, and have fun with it. Hi, I'm Garrett Brown. I invented the study cam. This is Ted Churchill and Jerry Hallway, two masters of the study cam. Thank you. Um, we're going to explain how to use the new cinema product, Steadicam EFP. Wait a minute, what are you guys doing here? Have you done all this? Well, yeah, but I wasn't about to interrupt you. Well, how was it? Well, it was great. Yeah, good for me. You liked it. Good for me. Well, there's my plane. I'll oh, see you guys. Hey, Garrett, nice to see you. That was Garrett Brown. He invented the Steadicam in 1978. He won an Academy Award. Fortunately, he's not doing it anymore.